I'd like to really, the first thing is just thank uh, Mr. Roberts and Mr. Trunk is not here for his kind words. And all of you people in this room, uh, I have done, as you'll see when I'm done talking, I've done very little compared to what you've done. You guys are the ones that have been there for working men and women all across the country. I, uh, as you'll see, what I did was just very, pretty simple to do. But I thank you. I thank you all with all, all my heart, and I want to tell you something. Uh, if ever there was a man who's standing here with, uh, and I'm not going to say spirits standing around me, but I've got the spirit of 44 working men and women that I interviewed back in 1985-86, and they're here with me right now. And that's probably the only reason I want to get through this. With that and Tim Sheard, who's my publisher, and uh, my accidental publisher, because <laughs> I, I wrote this two years ago for my high school students who I, I was retired and I wanted them to see what their ancestors, what working men and women that had been their grandfathers and grandfathers, what they had done and the sacrifices they had made for them. And that was the purpose of the book. Um, and I wrote it, the story, and I'll tell you how I wrote it in a second, and then uh, I sent it to my family and my friends and my former students. And somehow they sent it to other people. I mean, I'm giving it away. It's on word form. And I'm giving it to anybody who wants it just so they'll understand the working men and women, what they've done. And somebody sent it to Tim, and we, I don't think we've ever figured out how it got there. And uh, last December, he calls me up out of the clear blue and says, I want to publish your book. And I thought, well, first of all, which book? I got four books. I, I, I didn't know he even, and he told me 16 tons, and I uh, said, well, I'm not paying anything for it. I mean, gosh, I don't if you don't think it's worth publishing, I don't. He said, it's worth publishing. And, I, I, and I'm going to tell you now, I'll just tell you real briefly. In 1985-86, Colin Davis, uh, I was doing my master's degree work, uh, uh, and I had a choice to either write a master's thesis or do an internship. And, and I got to thinking, which is easiest? And, and Colin told me, uh, you did a good oral history in my class, and, and this guy named Carl Oblinger wants somebody to do oral histories of coal miners, and, um, and they'll pay you. Well, I needed a lawnmower, too. And uh, at that time, I had three quarters of an acre, and I, and I was push mowing it, and I thought, well, if he pays me, then I can buy the lawnmower. And so uh, I thought, this is going to be great. All i got to do is go to these people's houses, push record on a tape recorder, ask the questions that have already been given to me, and um, then I give the, trans the tape to somebody else. They transcribe it, and isn't that wonderful? That's so easy, and it was. And I got my lawnmower, too. <laughs> and, but the thing is that uh, what was amazing, what the problem was I fell in love with those people, uh, those 44 working men and women who were all in their mostly 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, after I was done with the interview, Carl wrote a book called Divided Kingdom that was published about the coal mine wars of the 1930s. And, 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 and we had a book signing. And all those people, those 44 people I interviewed were there. They were all alive. And they came and they sat around tables and we did book signings. And boy, was that cool. And, and why would they want my signature? These guys are the ones that lived it. They did it. And so it haunted me for years, and I taught history. I taught uh, uh, eighth grade history, ninth grade civics, and, uh, and I would tell my students, well, one of the things uh, was labor history. I covered that in my class at the end of the year. And we learned about uh, yellow dog contracts and, and, and picketing and all these different things. And I would tell them the stories that happened right in their neighborhood, Christian County, Illinois. And these students would, I, I, I'm telling you the truth. In fact, we're going to visit Rodney Davis later, who's a congressman from, uh, uh, he was one of my students in ninth grade. And, and, and he, uh, he asked me to stop by and see him this evening. And, and he can remember, that when I told these stories, people like Rodney would say, that couldn't have happened. No way something like Ludlow or Matawan or, or <coughs> Blair Mountain could have happened. I've never heard of 10,000 people soldier you know going up on a mountain and fighting the police and bombs dropping on them why why isn't that in the history book mm. and i said it happened so luckily we had internets by then we, i said go out and search for it 
And they did, and they came back and they said, Mr. Corley, that's the most incredible stories I've ever heard. That needs to be a book, that needs to be a movie. Well, Matawan's a good movie, you know, we got a little bit of it there. We got a few bits and pieces. But when Carl wrote his book, he saw, he was really focusing on the 1930s and what happened. But when I interviewed people, some of them had lived, were alive in 1900. So when I talked to them, I'd ask them questions. They'd tell me about or, you know, uh, the Pena strike and what happened. And by the way, the first chapter is the only part of the book that's really based on legend. It's based on oral tradition. Uh, people told me that happened. We don't know for sure. Nobody ever found the bodies. But supposedly they threw some bodies in a grave, either a gravel pit or down a well, or, or down into the mine and buried the bodies. Uh, we don't know for sure and we may never know. Uh, and skipping ahead real quick in case you hadn't paid the notice, but the Heron massacres in there where 19 strike breakers were killed in 1922 and they just found those bodies last November wow. in a potter's field in Heron, Illinois. And the people of Heron didn't want them to look for them to this day, did not want them to look for those bodies. And people, and uh, there was a lot of politicking going on. A guy named Scott Duty was able to uh, uh, get the rights to dig through the field and they found the bodies, 16 bodies recently. Uh, anyway, I, I told the kids these stories in school and, they, and they, they said it couldn't happen. And so two years ago, a wonderful thing happened. I got fired. <laughs> I got fired. I, I worked for the Boys and Girls Club after school program, which is the best program in the world. But they, they're dependent on grants, and they, the grant ran out, and they said, well, you're, you're done. We're not going to pay you for the summer. So I thought, well, what am I going to do all summer? I've worked every summer since I was nine years old. I was almost your age then when I was working. And, and, and I, uh, I didn't know what to do with my time. And, but these memories and these stories from these people kept haunting me. And so I thought, well, I'll just write the book. Well, how do you write the book? It was real simple. I just got all the oral histories that I had done, and I took the really neat quotes and, uh, and from the, my people and put them in order. Stuff from 1910, 1915, 1920. Just put them in order. So you know what I got right now? The best dialogue in the world. My dialogue comes right from the people I interviewed. A lot of the words are right from the people either I interviewed or somebody else interviewed. And I am the greatest plagiarist in the world, <laughs> am I, Tim? Because I, I stole their words from these people. I stole words from Mother Jones, God forgive me for that. You know what I did, those are her words. I didn't know if I had the right to use them. I asked Tim and he said, I don't think Mother Jones will care. <laughs> and so, Mother Jones's words are there. Uh, I, I, I had to invent a few things, but for the most part, it was easy. I wrote it in six weeks. In six weeks, the whole book was done. I was sending it off to my friends. I never touched it again. And uh, never re we read a lot of the parts, especially the middle and the end. And uh, how it ever got to this point, all I can tell you is it's got to be because these 44 people are standing around me right now. And I want to tell you about one of them real quick. A lady named Lena Dory was about 90 when I interviewed her. She was from Italy. Came over on the boat, she said. And uh, I was sitting in her living room interviewing her. I can remember where I was sitting with every single one of the 44 people. Which is, isn't that haunt, isn't that weird? And I, and I, that's why I said I'm crazy, I'm half nuts. But, but I can remember where I was sitting and what I was doing and what I was drinking and what the people were doing around me. And Lena Doherty was sitting there, and she's 90 years old, and she had the most beautiful eyes I'd ever seen. 90 years old, gorgeous eyes. And, and uh, I couldn't describe her eyes. And so when I'm writing the book, there was one part where I described a character named Sam's eyes. Do you remember that part? I don't know if you do. Sam's eyes, Sam, Sam's one of the girls in the thing, and I, want, I thought I'm gonna give her Lena's eyes, Lena Doherty's. So I thought, how can I describe her eyes? And I've had more compliments on that one line than I've had on anything else in the book just about, because I said her eyes looked, they, uh, it was like looking through a, green, a thin green leaf at a clear blue sky. 
Well, I want to tell you, that's Lena Doherty's eyes. When I was done interviewing Lena Doherty, Lena uh, asked me, said, do me one favor. Don't publish this till I die. Don't tell anybody you interviewed me till I die. Don't tell my family. Don't tell anybody. You got to promise me. And she gave me some tortellinis, <laughs> which are in the book. Those are Lena's tortellinis, and that's Lena's name in Lena Ainge, one of my characters. And I said, okay, I won't do that. I, I, I won't tell anybody in your family till you die. I thought, well, that'll be easy. She, what is she, 90? <laughs> About 15 years later, <laughs> her, her kids are calling me every year. Please interview our mom. Please interview our grandma. Please interview great grandma. Everybody in the, is mad at me. They think I'm the, neglecting the most important woman in Christian County, who was Lena Doherty. And finally, I said, she's never going to die. So yeah, when the, when the son called, I said, I interviewed her. Yeah, it's down there. I'll give you, come on over. I'll give you a copy right now. He was over there in five minutes. I gave him a copy. He went back to mom. She said, he said he wouldn't tell her until <laughs> I died. And I, and I just said, just tell her that's her fault. <laughs> you know, I can't wait. How much longer am I supposed to wait? Well, she did, she did die. I love the woman. I love the women. I love the people in my book. If you don't mind me saying, these four guys on the front are the Bob brothers. I interviewed them when they were in their 80s. They're little boys here. They had such an impressive story. I, I, I centered my story around the Bob brothers. Uh, their father, this is the truth, truth is exactly what's in the book. Their father came out of the Spanish-American War, took his money, bought some land in a little town called, mining town called Hewittville. And he, he, his wife started a garden and she supplied food. That's how they helped supplement their gardens. And she, uh, uh, they had four boys and they built a house as each of them got old and had a family, they had their houses right next to each other. The houses are still there, the boys are gone, families are gone, but um, that, that's my story. Everything in here, just about, is based on truth. Mm -hmm.